herzlich willkommen im Hacker Morgengrauen, im Stream der Cyber ist der Raumstation unter Berlin Mitte. Das ist schon der zweite Talk heute. Wir begrüßen diesmal Alex. Hallo Alex. Hallo, guten Morgen. Alexander Sander zum Thema Public Code in der Pandemie. Public Money, Public Code genauer gesagt. Also wir möchten doch gerne für das sauer abgesparte Steuergeld auch Dinge zurückbekommen und nicht Dinge, wo wir hinterher nicht ran dürfen und nicht reingucken dürfen und nichts mitmachen dürfen. Und welche Bedeutung das hat und warum das langfristig noch wichtiger wird, das wird Alex uns gleich lang und breit erklären. Ähm, ja, so lang und so breit wie nötig, bis ungefähr 1 Uhr. Und äh, wenn ihr Fragen habt, dann benutzt den Hashtag RC3 und äh, dann werden wir versuchen, das in einem Pad zu materialisieren und noch kurz darüber zu sprechen um eins. Gut, Alex, dann halbe Stunde für dich. Viel Spaß. Ja, vielen Dank. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 12.30. <lacht> Good morning. Uh, that's, that's lovely. Um, yeah, so in the next 30 minutes, I will talk about uh, public money, public code and uh, what role um, free software played during the crisis and uh, is still playing. And um, so my name is Alexander Sander. I'm policy consultant of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, we are a charity that empowers users to control technology. And um, yeah, we do believe that uh, free software um, plays a crucial role here. Um, so to get us in the mood, um, uh, I think you uh, all remember uh, it was around March last year uh, when the borders have been closed uh, because of the crisis. Um, so we wanted to avoid contacts and um, yeah, one solution uh, back in the days was um, to close borders. And um, as you know, um, free movement is a fundamental right and to fix this issue, um, software played an uh, important role um, and contact tracing apps, for example, have been um, um, pushed on the uh, market uh, to, to fix this and um, I will talk about this a bit later. And also we have seen um, us and uh, many of us in home office and again here um, software um, was very important and um, as well free software played an important role. And as said in the next minutes, I will tell you why and um, free software is important and, um, as, and specifically um, uh, what uh, free software um, solutions um, helped us to tackle the crisis. So everybody loves free software, especially uh, I think here um, uh, around Seabase and uh, the Congress, uh, free software is uh, pretty well known. However, um, uh, let me introduce you quickly the concept of free software. So it's also sometimes called um, Libre software, open source software, but um, free software uh, always comes with four freedoms and it's the freedom to use, study, share and improve. This means free software gives you the freedom to use the software for any purpose you want without any restrictions. You are free to study the code so it can be analyzed by anyone. So you can see the code, you can see what the software is going to do, what it does. You're also free to share the software without any limitations. Um, so there are no um, like license costs or something like this. So um, you can install it on as many workstations uh, as you want and so on. Um, but here, please keep in mind, um, the price doesn't matter. So free is um, not uh, coming with the price in general. So you can also sell free software and this is also done. Um, but um, you are free to share it afterwards. And also you are free to improve the software. You can modify it. And um, by this, you can um, give back to the community. And whenever we have these four freedoms to use, study, share and improve, then it is free software or a set of their many names like open source, Libre software and so on. And these four freedoms helped us during the crisis um, a lot uh, when it came to software solutions. Um, to give you a better understanding um, um, of the four freedoms I just named in practical terms, I um, have this uh, slide here with, uh, for, for you where I will first show you the problems of proprietary software. So software which is not coming with this um, four freedoms and on the other hand, um, on a practical um, uh, way, the four freedoms um, as a solution for free software. So first, um, the, the major problem uh, with proprietary software is that there is no interoperability at all. Um, you might have um, yeah, <laughs> this problem uh, as well a lot. Um, so it's um, 
uh, the uh, thing that you are stuck in an ecosystem and um, if you buy a piece of software from one vendor you always have to go back to this one vendor um, to like broaden your system so um, programs are not working together um, so there are, is no connection and uh, by thus uh, we call it interoperability um, this is something we don't see at proprietary software and uh, but as you are coming into this vendor login as said if you um, buy one piece of a software let's say um, an office solution um, then uh, you need to buy um, a mail program or a presentation um, um, thingy or something like this uh, from the same vendor because as you want to have want to have interoperability um, these proprietary vendors only give you interoperability in their own system but if you want to go out of the system then you run into struggles and there's no interoperability at all so this is a problem with data sharing uh, with others um, but also like collaborative working and so on and um, this also means that these pieces of software come with unpredictable costs. Um, so first of all, you have to buy um, a piece of software, then you don't know um, how much you have to pay for the other pieces you might need um, in the future, but also you don't know um, at one point you have to pay for upgrades, for updates, and so on. And so it's uh, really hard to estimate um, the costs for, um, yeah, the software in the future and this is also a huge problem uh, which is coming with proprietary software and also as you have to pay for the license first and uh, mainly also like for a license for every workstation and so on your investments are lost so um, you can't invest the money into the coding um, but you just pay for licensing and so that's why um, your investments are also just lost in the very beginning and we have seen during the crisis i will show you um, some examples later that there's also a very low acceptance by citizens if they have to um, or if they are forced um, to use proprietary software and in the end um, there are also security issues uh, as you can't uh, look into the code you uh, might don't find backdoors for example or you can't see if a software really is going to do what it's supposed to do and um, so therefore um, proprietary software also comes with um, security issues and so on the other hand we have uh, the solution uh, it's uh, risk free software because we have there we have these open standards um, this is coming from the four freedoms as you are free, for example, to look in the code, as you can modify it and so on. Um, and as it's based on open standard, we have this interoperability by default. And so we can like work together across borders and uh, it's very easy to collaborate um, if you are using free software because you have this interoperability by default. Also, you are highly independent um, through the free licenses. Um, so the four freedoms are always guaranteed um, when it is free software, so you are free to modify and adapt it to your needs. Um, you are free to share it, to use it in as many workstations as you want, and so on, as just said. So you are highly independent. And by thus, you can also collaborate. And this is also something we have seen heavily during the crisis, that collaboration is key. Uh, especially uh, when it comes to global crisis, we need to work across borders, we need to collaborate across borders. And so um, with this collaboration, we can share risks but also costs um, so this is a big advantage uh, of free software and um, also you can involve local partners so this is uh, especially something we see uh, when it comes to the use of free software within in administrations uh, public bodies um, so whenever um, yeah um, governments are using uh, free software then there's a, a huge involvement of local partners which is also like a strengthening not only um, the software project but also the region and so on. And uh, it is transparent by default, as you can see the code. Uh, this is um, very important. Uh, it's also one of the freedoms. And because of this um, transparency, you can see the code. And by thus, you can, for example, identify um, bugs. You can fix bugs quickly. And um, so uh, free software um, gives you the advantage to make your software even more secure. And um, so free software, isn't secure by default but you have the chance to quickly find um, security issues but also other issues and fix them immediately so and this is also a big advantage so you don't have to go back to a vendor and ask him if he can fix something you can simply do it by your own or the community can does so 
With all of this, um, you can also already see why it is a very good idea to use free software uh, in general, but also in particular during a crisis, which is uh, with, uh, what we have seen, especially during the Corona crisis. So we need to work together because global problems need global solutions. So, and um, as already said, uh, during the Corona crisis, we have seen a lot that there was uh, free software uh, around and that it, was, that it was very good that we used free software and not proprietary software. And that there, especially in the beginning, there were um, very interesting debates around it. Um, I think you might remember uh, the tracing apps and so on. But we have seen um, that yeah, in global crisis, um, the demands are very similar. So, um, for example, when it comes to contact tracing um, or something like this, we have seen um, that specific software and specific hardware is and was uh, needed. And um, for home office, for example, or for remote work working, we have seen this, and especially with the tracing and now with the certificate apps, we see that there are more or less um, the same demands around the world. Um, and especially if we look at Europe, um, there are uh, more or less the same solutions as we want to yeah, um, be um, uh, yeah, a European um, region without borders um, and so on. And here, again, the solution is that we need interoperability. So we need these open standards to be able to collaborate, to work together and um, to also um, use the free licenses and um, to um, spread the software as wide as possible. And um, also that we need to um, foster the innovation and collaborate. So this, uh, we have seen this a lot, um, that it was very important that it's not only coders who work on a project or not only a nation or a specific region working on a project, but that we have to involve many stakeholders from many countries working on um, specific um, projects. And this is only possible with free software as we can work and collaborate across borders. And we have also seen that the transparency of free software gives us acceptance. And this is very important, especially if you want to roll out software projects uh, on a very large level. Um, you need acceptance, especially by citizens, that they use um, the systems and therefore transparency is and uh, also was key. And um, yeah, as said, uh, as you can uh, involve uh, all stakeholders, uh, this is also a big advantage. And I want to give you a concrete example now um, with the apps. Uh, I think most of you are using uh, at least um, one or two of these <laughs> free software apps, which are uh, around at the moment. And um, when the debate started, it was also um, like one and a half year ago, um, we were discussing these contact tracing apps. And um, it was a discussion if it should decentralize decentralized, if it should be free software or proprietary software and so on. And um, we very quickly um, um, jumped in with a press release and uh, uh, advocated uh, around governments uh, with three demands, and uh, they are still uh, valid today. And uh, the first demand is that um, no matter what it is, um, these apps need to be used voluntarily. So this is uh, not that much on free software, but it's also key that it's um, a voluntary. But then uh, it also must respect fundamental rights. So um, whenever these apps are introduced and uh, when there are health data, for example, um, uh, in these apps, uh, um, then we must respect fundamental rights, for example, the right to privacy and so on. And um, we can only see if fundamental rights are protected, if the code is transparent, and if we can prove um, that the software is really going to do um, what it's supposed to do. And in the end, so we said, uh, all of these apps and solutions uh, need to be free software. And we have been very successful with this demand. And uh, there was, uh, as I said, a very huge debate. And um, what uh, made us very happy uh, was that uh, there was not only a debate and uh, not only the apps have been released as free software, but um, there were some fundamental statements uh, during the time, for example, from the World Health Organizations, um, and they said um, they need to be full there need to be full transparency, and these apps um, need to uh, be open sourced. And also the European eHealth Network, so this is the European Commission and the member states of the European Union, uh, released a toolbox uh, for the member states uh, where they said um, um, or where they um, yeah defined 
um, how these mobile uh, applications um, need to be designed uh, in the European Union. Um, and um, here they said um, also that it uh, need to be open sourced. And uh, what makes us very happy that they not just said it need to be open source, but they also said it's good for reuse, it's good for interoperability, it's good for the security and the transparency. And so they um, followed our arguments fully. And this is um, um, yeah very important that the European um, uh, Union, but also the World Health Organization quickly understood um, that it's only free software um, that ca can help us during this time and the crisis. And we have quickly um, seen that um, there is this community engagement and that it's not just about um, hackers and coders who improve um, apps, but it's also about translations, for example. So we need people with language skills, but also, um, especially when it comes to the tracing um, um, apps, uh, we also need like uh, scientists from all areas who can tell us um how such a virus spread and so on and how we can trace it um so here we have seen um how global cooperation can work and um can um like lead to a um, situation that we have um a very good app in the end uh, which helps us in this case for contact tracing in the very beginning and um here you can um yeah see um <laughs> what happened uh, on on Git, um, but also with the CovPass app, um, we have seen that it's now available on Android. Um, unfortunately, um, in Germany, the CovPass app, so this is the app uh, which gives you your COVID certificate that you are um, um, yeah, uh, vaccin vaccinated, or, um, for example. And um, so in Germany, this app was um, free software, but it was not released on um, Ftroid and Ftroid is a free software app store. So the yeah the better app store compared to Play Store, where right? because in Ftroid you can only find free software. But what happened is that the community again stepped in. So volunteers helped us to make it possible that this app is now also available on Ftroid. And by thus um, yeah, it's also um, possible to use it on um, more devices than before. And um, it's also um, you are. Um, free to use it without any Google services, which is also very important when it comes to privacy and so on. So here we have seen that um, with the use of free software, we can uh, make this app available to everyone and we can ensure that fundamental rights are respected and um, that uh, everything is based on free software and that you, for example, don't need Google services um, to use these apps. But on the other hand, what happened later, so uh, after the good news, yeah, <laughs> there are also always bad news. Um, in October last year, uh, the European Commission uh, released an open source strategy. So just half a year later, after they said, uh, when it came to the CovPass apps uh, and COVID apps, uh, where they said uh, it's important that they are transparent because of security reasons, interoperability, and so on, um, they gave um, themselves a strategy. So the European Commission released uh, an open source strategy for themselves, um, how they want to act um, and how they want to use free software in the future. And unfortunately, um, there they watered down um, a lot. So um, it was not like that they said, so now we learned and we want to have now everything on free software because this is our learning from the crisis. This is our learning from the last decades. Um, no, they said um, they want to release their um, solutions wherever it makes sense to do so as open source. And uh, they uh, also want to be uh, in a position to choose non-open technologies where there are good reasons to do so. So, But uh, at the same time, they never ever um, defined what are good reasons and uh, where something makes sense. So this is completely open. Um, and so what is good on the one hand is that they have something like open source strategy so that they are thinking about it, that they are giving themselves a strategy. But at the same time, if they're releasing this paper with so many loopholes, um, we um, fear that there won't be a major change here. And um, I think, or we do believe um, that um, not only the crisis have shown us that free software is the way to go, um, but also like, yeah, last decades and also before the crisis, um, we have advocating a lot around this and um, we have seen many administrations 
who have very good experience with free software, not only when it comes to crisis, but also in general. Uh, again, here, think about home office, think about video chats, uh, what we are do using here today, Jitsi, a free software um, tool, but also Big Blue Button is, for example, one. So nobody ha has to be uh, forced to use um, proprietary solutions uh, like Zoom or something like this. So there are very good um, free software um, tools on the market and um, there are good reasons to use them, especially when it comes to administrations, because they are in contact with citizens, with us. And um, I think um, this is, again, a learning from the crisis. Transparency, for example, is key, but also interoperability, so that we are um, free to use um, whatever device we want, um, but are still in a position to communicate with administrations. So, and they also um, said they want to set up a small, open source program office. Um, there is no budget at all for this. Um, so um, what sounds very good from the first, very first page, so think open, um, that's the title of the strategy, turns out to be um, yeah, a paper full of loopholes. And um, we are still in contact with the European Commission uh, in order to learn what they are doing. Um, from uh, what we have seen so far, it's not that much. Um, they just released another new paper, and um, but uh, still we don't see any budget. We don't see any people working on this. So that we are specifically hired for this um, after the strategy was um, introduced and so on. Um, so, but um, yeah, stay tuned. Um, uh, hopefully we can release some news on this um, soonish on our website, but the commission is very, um, yeah, let's say closed uh, when we ask about their think open strategy. Uh, which is uh, at the same time very strange. And so, as I said already before the crisis, um, uh, not only us, but hundreds of organizations and also um, tens of thousands of individuals demanded that publicly financed software must be made publicly available under a free software license. And um, I think with the crisis, we have learned that it's now even more important than ever before to tell administrations and to convince administrations to use free software. And it's not only about crisis, but it's also about digital sovereignty, for example. So also for administrations, it's good um, to know what uh, a software does if they use it. Um, so it's in the core of our state digital infrastructure and therefore the administrations need to have the full control over the software they are using. And this is also true for everybody else, like for us individuals, but also for um, um, yeah, companies and um, civil society and so on. So it's a, in terms of digital sovereignty, a very good uh, idea to use um, free software. But it's also about our money. It's public money. It's taxpayers' money. And public bodies are financed through taxes. And that's why they have to make sure they spend their funds in the most efficient way possible. And as I've shown to you, um, I think there's only one solution, and this is free software in the end. And um, to give you um, one number here, and um, just imagine um, uh, this money would uh, have been invested in free software in the last years. So the gov governments and public bodies, public administrations are the largest purchasers of IT goods and services, and they um, comprise up to 27% of the revenue of software firms. And so now just think about if we would use these 27% and invest it in free software and think about the solutions we would have had during the crisis already, for example, to be able to have a secured um, um, workspace for home office and so on, but also to be available to be in a digital administrations. And um, so I think, um, yeah, this number is uh, very important and shows us um, that there are many investments lost because we are, or administrations are still buying proprietary software and uh, didn't switch to free software. So in the end, um, free software gives you um, yeah, many advantages. You can, as said, involve local partners. So whenever administrations um, or public bodies are procuring free software, we can see that it's also strengthening the local economy. So um, licensing uh, fees are not going anymore to Ireland and the US, um, but it's also um, highly efficient. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again. So administrations all over the world have pretty much more or less the same demands. 
And um, so why do we have to reinvent the wheel again and again and buy one piece of software again and again? And um, so there's absolutely no reason. Uh, and it would be way more efficient to collaborate. And um, we can also see that when administrations are doing this, um, it's happening. And also, again, we have this um, digital sovereignty. So you are, um, yeah, can have a software which is tailored to your needs and uh, you can modify it whenever you want and adapt it to your needs. And it's not just like um, a vendor's business model, what you are following. And so therefore, free software is a very good idea. So and if you are um, in line with our <laughs> arguments and if you like our arguments, you are um, still free to sign our campaign. So uh, three years, four years ago now, we started our campaign, Public Money, Public Code, where we um, demand that um, whenever it, it's public money, uh, the code should be also public. And um, so we want legislation requiring that publicly financed software developed for the public sector um, uh, need to be uh, made publicly available under free uh, software license. And um, we are seeing in more and more treaties and um, also, for example, in the coalition treaty uh, in Germany, we have um, some sentences on the use of free software. And so we see that there is um, some progress here, but still um, we only um, need to, uh, not only we, we need to do uh, more pressure here, we have to fight um, uh, for public money, public code still. Um, we see more and more commitments, but at the same time, we um, yeah need to also follow up with the implementation, as we have seen, for example, with the European Commission, um, their open source strategy, which is called Think Open, but full of loopholes. And now it's important um, to see that there's a good implementation because this is key. Um, papers are important. Sure, this is the first step, but now we need to make sure that there's also a proper uh, implementation. And if you want to support us with our demand, um, you can also sign this campaign if you haven't uh, done already or reach out to us. We have several activities. Uh, we have also an activity package um, um, telling you how you can contact your local administration and convince them to use free software. Lots of our volunteers are doing this. Um, sometimes successfully. And so I think this is important that we um, yeah, continue to talk about the advantages of free software and um, also use um, the example from the crisis uh, I just have shown to you um, and continue our efforts to um, yeah, convince administrations to, uh, to switch to free software. And with this, I want to uh, end my talk and would be up for um, uh, questions if there are some in the pet in the meantime. Thank, thank you very, very much. Um, there's essentially one question popping up on our pads here, and this is about this term of digital sovereignty and uh, whether digital sovereignty uh, funded by national state actors would uh, uh, eventually mean that we are sooner or later hacking for the national security agencies of our countries and what that would imply to free software and the ethics of free software. Um, I mean, uh, uh, there was a bit uh, background noise, so uh, I'm not sure if I fully got it, but uh, it's about uh, if we would um, like, um, if, it, if, if our community uh, would um, like hack or fix governments, um, Software, if this is in line with the ethical principles of free software, was this was was this the question, or uh, did I get it wrong? Um, well, I, I'll try to uh, I'll try to address this. I think, um, um, yeah. Uh, governmental bodies um, are using free software or should use free software um, as they are handling our data, as they are uh, communicating with us. And for sure, um, also governmental bodies, bodies are uh, using software for surveillance, for example, uh, for reasons um, um, we might personally don't like. Uh, and um, this is very different. So, and um, nobody should be forced to like um, invest the time or um, like resources to help governments to to fix their um, software and um, it's also again on procurement so uh, as said um, free software um, doesn't need to be um, priceless so um, also um, for us it's important 
that um, if public bodies are using software, then whatever it is, it should be free software. Um, and this gives us the chance to see the code and, for example, to discuss. And um, this also opens debates um, if we want a solution uh, which is going to work like this. And um, this doesn't necessarily mean that we contribute to the code, but we can also contribute to a software by um, discussing um, what it does. Is this something we want to have for our society? Is this a software we really need? And um, this is, um, I think, only possible if we have something like, for example, a repository um, for governmental um, software which is used, and then we can like check what this is, what they are doing. And um, it doesn't mean that um, that you have to do it, but you are free to do it. And I think this is important, and this is also what we have seen during the crisis. So. Um, there are um, some general um, or fundamental discussions uh, about the apps and um, about tracing and so on. Um, but this is possible because it is free software and it doesn't mean that you have to contribute to the code or that you have to use it. So as we said, uh, it's important that it's um, um, that people can use it voluntarily. Um, but still, you can contribute even if you just debate around it. So, and I think this is this is important, and that is why uh, we want free software. And I think in the end, it's better to have a free software project where you can see what the software does and where a government tells you transparently what they are going to do, uh, instead of doing it completely um, secretly. Very well. So that uh, demonstrates that we ha that we have uh, maybe another problem or a new problem, but uh, a constructive one, something we can work on. And uh, th this whole issue of uh, digital sovereignty and national state actors must be discussed, as you said. This was Absolutely. the main question from, from the PET. So uh, thank okay. you for the talk this morning. And, yeah, thanks um, for having me. Yeah, it was fun. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference then. Yes. I hope you do too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you. Bye bye. Everything is uh, licensed under a CC BY 4.0, and it is all for the community. To download for everybody.